Antonio Santi Giuseppe Mucci was an Italian inventor and an associate of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Mucci is best known for developing a voice communication apparatus which several sources credit as the first telephone. Mucci set up a former voice communication link in his Staten Island, New York home in which the second floor bedroom connected to his laboratory. He submitted a patent caveat for his telephonic device to the U.S. Patent Office in 1871, but there was no mention of electromagnetic transmission of vocal sound in his caveat. In 1876, Alexander Graham Bell was granted a patent for the electromagnetic transmission of vocal sound by undulatory electric current. Early life. Mucci was born at Via dei Sorali 44 in the San Frediano borough of Florence, Grand Duchy of Tuscany, on 13 April 1808. As the first of nine children to Amatus Mucci and Domenica Pepe, Amatus was at times a government clerk and a member of the local police, and Domenica was principally a homemaker. Four of Mucci's siblings did not survive childhood. In November 1821, at the age of 15, he was admitted to Florence Academy of Fine Arts as its youngest student, where he studied chemical and mechanical engineering. He ceased full-time studies two years later due to insufficient funds, but continued studying part-time after obtaining employment as an assistant gatekeeper and customs official for the Florentine government. Mucci later became employed at the Teatro della Perga in Florence as a stage technician, assisting Artemio Canovetti. In 1834 Mucci constructed a type of acoustic telephone to communicate between the stage and control room at the Teatro della Pergola. This telephone was constructed on the principles of pipe telephones used on ships and still functions. He married costume designer Esther Mochi, who was employed in the same theater, on 7 August 1834, Havana, Cuba. In October 1835, Mucci and his wife emigrated to Cuba, then a Spanish province, where Mucci accepted a job at what was then called the Great Taken Theater in Havana. In Havana he constructed a system for water purification and reconstructed the Grand Teatro. In 1848 his contract with the governor expired. Mucci was asked by a friend's doctors to work on Franz Anton Mesmer's therapy system on patients suffering from rheumatism. In 1849, he developed a popular method of using electric shocks to treat illness and subsequently experimentally developed a device through which one could hear an articulate human voice. He called this device telegraph or parlant. In 1850, the third renewal of Mucci's contract with Don Francisco Marti y Torrens expired, and his friendship with General Giuseppe Garibaldi made him a suspect citizen in Cuba. On the other hand, the fame reached by Samuel F. B. Morse in the United States encouraged Mucci to make his living through inventions. Moved to Staten Island, New York. On 13 April 1850, Mucci and his wife emigrated to the United States, taking with them approximately 26,000 pesos fuertes in savings, and settled in the Clifton area of Staten Island, New York. The Muchis would live there for the remainder of their lives. In Staten Island he helped several countrymen committed to the Italian unification movement and who had escaped political persecution. Mucci invested the substantial capital he had earned in Cuba in a tallow candle factory employing several Italian exiles. For two years Mucci hosted friends at his cottage, including General Giuseppe Garibaldi and Colonel Paolo Bovi Campeggi who arrived in New York two months after Mucci. They worked in Mucci's factory. In 1854, Mucci's wife Esther became an invalid due to rheumatoid arthritis. Mucci continued his experiments. Electromagnetic Telephone Mucci studied the principles of electromagnetic voice transmission for many years and was able to realize his dream of transmitting his voice. Through wires in 1856, he installed a telephone-like device within his house in order to communicate with his wife who was ill at the time. 
Some of Mucci's notes written in 1857 describe the basic principle of electromagnetic voice transmission or in other words, the telephone, consistor in un diaphragma vibranti in un magneta electricito dar un filo a spiral celo a volger, vibranda, il diaphragma altera la corrente del magneta. Questa alterazione di corrente trasmessa all'altro capo del filo imprimino analoga vibrazione al diaframma riceventuri riproducione la parola. Translated, it consists of a vibrating diaphragm in an electrified magnet with a spiral wire that wraps around it. The vibrating diaphragm alters the current of the magnet. These alterations of current, transmitted to the other end of the wire, create analogous vibrations of the receiving diaphragm and reproduce the word. Mucci devised an electromagnetic telephone as a way of connecting his second-floor bedroom to his basement laboratory, and thus being able to communicate with his wife. Between 1856 and 1870, Mucci developed more than 30 different kinds of telephones on the basis of this prototype. Around 1858, painter Nestor Corradi sketched Mucci's ideas. This drawing was used as the image on a stamp produced in 2003 by the Italian Postal and Telegraph Society. Mucci intended to develop his prototype but did not have the financial means to keep his company afloat in order to finance his invention. His candle factory went bankrupt and Mucci was forced to unsuccessfully seek funds from rich Italian families. In 1860, he asked his friend Enrico Bandellari to look for Italian capitalists willing to finance his project. However, military expeditions led by Garibaldi in Italy had made the political situation in that country too unstable for anybody to invest. Mucci then published his invention in the New York Italian language newspaper Elicio di Italia. Although no copy of such reports have ever been located dating back to searches prior to his court case in the 1880s, bankruptcy. At the same time, Mucci was led to poverty by some fraudulent debtors. On 13 November 1861 his cottage was auctioned. The purchaser allowed the Mucci's to live in the cottage without paying rent. But Mucci's private finances dwindled and he soon had to live on public funds and by depending on his friends. As mentioned in William J. Wallace's ruling, during the years 1859, 1860, and 1861, Mucci was in close business and social relations with William E. Ryder, who was interested in his inventions, paid the expenses of his experiments, and invested money in Mucci's inventions. Their close working friendship continued until 1867. In August 1870, Mucci reportedly was able to capture a transmission of articulated human voice at the distance of a mile by using a copper plate as a conductor, insulated by cotton. He called this device the teletrofono. While he was recovering from injuries that befell him in a boiler explosion aboard a Staten Island ferry, the Westfield, Mucci's financial and health state was so bad that his wife sold his drawings and devices to a second-hand dealer to raise money. Patent caveat. On 12 December 1871 Mucci set up an agreement with Angelo Zilio Grandi, Angelo Antonio Tremachine, Sereno GP, Breguia Tremachine, in order to constitute the Teletrofono Company. The constitution was notarized by Angelo Bertolino, a notary public of New York. Although the society funded him with $20, only $15 was needed to file for a full patent application. The caveat his lawyer submitted to the U.S. Patent Office on 28 December 1871 was numbered 3335 entitled, Sound Telegraph. The following is the text of Mucci's caveat, omitting legal details of the petition, oath, and jurat. Caveat the petition of Antonio Mucci, of Clifton, in the county of Richmond and state of New York, respectfully represents that he has made certain improvements in sound telegraphs. 
The following is a description of the invention, sufficiently in detail for the purposes of this caveat. I employ the well-known conducting effect of continuous metallic conductors as a medium for sound, and increases the effect by electrically insulating both the conductor and the parties who are communicating. It forms a speaking telegraph, without the necessity for any hollow tube. I claim that a portion or the whole of the effect may also be realized by a corresponding arrangement with a metallic tube. I believe that some metals will serve better than others but propose to try all kinds of metals. The system on which I propose to operate and calculate consists in isolating two persons, separated at considerable distance from each other. By placing them upon glass insulators, employing glass, for example, at the foot of the chair or bench on which each sits, and putting them in communication by means of a telegraph wire, I believe it preferable to have the wire of larger area than that ordinarily employed in the electric telegraph but will experiment on this. Each of these persons holds to his mouth an instrument analogous to a speaking trumpet, in which the word may easily be pronounced, and the sound concentrated upon the wire. Another instrument is also applied to their ears, in order to receive the voice of the opposite party. All these, to wit, the mouth utensil and their ear instruments, communicate to the wire at a short distance from the persons. The ear utensils being of a convex form, like a clock glass, enclose the whole exterior part of the ear, and make it easy and comfortable for the operator. The object is to bring distinctly to the hearing the word of the person at the opposite end of the telegraph. To call attention, the party at the other end of the line may be warned by an electric telegraph signal, or a series of them. The apparatus for this purpose, and the skill in operating it, need be much less than for the ordinary telegraphing. When my sound telegraph is in operation, the parties should remain alone in their respective rooms, and every practicable precaution should be taken to have the surroundings perfectly quiet. The closed mouth utensil or trumpet, and the enclosing the persons also in a room alone, both tend to prevent undue publicity to the communication. I think it will be easy, by these means, to prevent the communication being understood by any but the proper persons. It may be found practicable to work with the person sending the message insulated, and with the person receiving it in the free electrical communication with the ground. All these conditions may possibly be reversed and still operate with some success. Both the conductors or utensils for mouth and ears should be, in fact I must say must be, metallic, and be so conditioned as to be good conductors of electricity. I claim as my invention, and desire to have considered as such, for all the purposes of this caveat. The new invention herein set forth in all its details, combinations, and sub-combinations, and more especially, I claim first, a continuous sound conductor electrically insulated, second, the same adapted for telegraphing by sound or for conversation between distant parties electrically insulated, third, the employment of a sound conductor, which is also an electrical conductor, as a means of communication by sound between distant points. Fourth, the same in combination with provisions for electrically insulating the sending and receiving parties. Fifth, the mouthpiece or speaking utensil in combination with an electrically insulating conductor. Sixth, the ear utensils or receiving vessels adapted to apply upon the ears in combination with an electrically insulating sound conductor. Seventh, the entire system, comprising the electrical and sound conductor, insulated and furnished with a mouthpiece and earpieces at each end, adapted to serve as specified. In testimony whereof, I have here run to set my hand in presence of two subscribing witnesses. Antonio Meucci Witnesses, Shirley McAndrew, Fred K. Harper, Endorsed, Patent Office Deck, 28, 1871 Analysis of Mucci's caveat Mucci repeatedly focused on insulating the electrical conductor and even insulating the persons communicating.
but does not explain why this would be desirable. The mouthpiece is like a speaking trumpet, so that the sound concentrated upon the wire is communicated to the other person. But he does not say that the sound is to be converted to variable electrical conduction in the wire. Another instrument is also applied to their ears, but he does not say that variable electrical conduction in the wire is to be converted to sound. In the third claim, he claims a sound conductor which is also an electrical conductor, as a means of communication by sound, which is consistent with acoustic sound vibrations in the wire that somehow get transmitted better if electrical conductors such as a wire or metallic tube are used. Mucci emphasizes that the conductors for mouth and ears must be metallic, but does not explain why this would be desirable. He mentions communication with the ground, but does not suggest that a ground return must complete a circuit if only the wire is used between the sender's mouthpiece and the receiver's earpiece, with one or the other person being electrically insulated from the ground by means of glass insulators. Robert V Bruce, a biographer of Bell, asserted that Mucci's caveat never became a patent and never could have become one because it never described an electric telephone. Conflicting opinions of Mucci biographers according to Robert V, Bruce, who gave his personal interpretation of Giovanni e. Schiavo's research, Mucci's own testimony as presented by Schiavo would demonstrate that the Italian inventor did not understand the basic principles of the electric telephone, either before Bell invented it, or for several years after Bell invented it. Other researchers have pointed to several biases, inconsistencies, and inaccuracies in Bruce's account of the invention of the telephone. Firstly with the very name used by Mucci to describe his invention, Bruce referred to Mucci's device as a telephone, not as the teletrofono. Bruce's reporting of Mucci's purported relationship with Dr. Seth R. Beckwith has been deemed inaccurate. Mucci and his legal representative had cautioned Beckwith against misusing Mucci's name for financial gain. Visavis -vis the company Beckwith founded in New Jersey. Not only did Beckwith's Globe Telephone Co. base its claims against the Bell Telephone Company on Mucci's caveat, but the claims were also supported by approximately 30 affidavits, whereby it was stated that Mucci had repeatedly built and used different types of electric telephone several years before Bell did. English historian William Aitken does not share Robert V. Bruce's viewpoint. Bruce had indirectly referred to Mucci as the silliest and weakest imposter, while Aitken went so far as to define Mucci as the first creator of an electrical telephone. Other recognition of Mucci's work in the past came from the International Telecommunication Union, positing that Mucci's work was one of the four precursors to Bell's telephone, as well as from the Smithsonian Institution which listed Mucci as one of the eight most important inventors of the telephone in a 1976 exhibit. Mucci and his business partners hired an attorney, who filed a caveat on behalf of Mucci with the patent office. They had wanted to prepare a patent application, but the partners did not provide the $250 fee, so all that was prepared was a caveat, since the fee for that was only $20. However, the caveat did not contain a clear description of how the asserted invention would actually function. Mucci advocates claim the attorney erased margin notes which Mucci had added to the document, 